Death and dying is number 12. It's the last activity of daily living. I'm going to leave that up there very briefly. But the reason being, now I'm going to try and be as serious as I can for a moment. I know that's not normally my thing. Um, when it comes to death and dying, I do want you to be very, very mindful of how that affects you and what kind of things you take home. Now, I say that because this is one of those topics that we may have never really thought about before, we, or we have, but we really haven't paid too much mind to it. If you go through your, your student nursing career and don't see a death, I will be slightly surprised. I think it's probably a good thing to see a death or, or go through that experience as a student because when you're an RN and you're on your own, you're kind of expected to be able to do everything and know all the answers. So I think that if you're on placement and you do come across someone who's passed away, please don't shy away from their cares because I think it's important that you know what's involved. So when you are an RN on your own, you kind of have a bit of a sense of understanding of what you need to do. I know as a student, um, it was really difficult to go home and relate to people like even my mum or my, my girlfriend at the time because they don't really understand what you're going through, especially if you've ever had your first death as a professional. And it's very different from um, having a death of a loved one. Um, there's a lot of very different emotions. You're all going to be on placement at the same time. Check in with each other. Make a time to meet up for coffee and say, hey, How's your placement? Anything you want to debrief with? Because you guys are going to be the only people that fully understand um, how this is going. You're going to come across patients, be they paediatrics in my experience, be that in an aged care setting. There's really only one end to, to what we're going through. And unfortunately, as nurses, we're going to be there on the best days of people's lives. We're going to be able to hold people's hands. We're going to be able to see people being born. But we might also be there for their very last days on earth as well. So we've got to be really prepared and emotionally quite capable of going through these. And anyone listening to my lecture when I was talking about that lady who had a coffin in her room and I signed it, and that, for me, was this massive wake-up call because I was like, wow, people actually do think about these things. And I think it's important, like I've been saying for the whole course, know who you are as a person, how you react to things, your views on things, because this is a time where you really need to have your stuff together and you need to be able to be cognizant enough to be able to emotionally go through this journey with someone, especially if you're on an aged care. Maybe some people are palliative. Maybe you're going into an oncology ward. And unfortunately, end of life is going to be everywhere and you need to be prepared to deal with that. You're also paying a lot of money to be at university. Please make sure you're acutely aware of all the different services that we offer. So counselling service, you can do Skype interviews. You can, it doesn't have to be face to face, but please know if you're affected by any of this, there's lots of services for you. So a few terminologies that we're going to discuss. So death, I think, is, um, is quite an obvious one for you guys. Obviously, because your first placement is in age care, this is often what we think about, that, you know, death at the end of the age care. But this could be anywhere that you're going to be on placement. You could be in PEDS, you could be out in the mental health area. Everywhere you go and every age group, you might encounter um, death within your placement. Um, so loss. So the state exists when something or someone has now gone. So we've had someone die and the other person that is left there is going through a stage of loss. So the reaction to that loss we term as grief, uh, bereavement, so the state of having a loss, and mourning is that cultural or, or social expression of going through that grief and loss. The different types of loss, and we're going to go through each of those a little bit, the different types of loss, so actual loss, so actual loss is normally associated when someone dies and we've actually lost something. A perceived loss. Now, this might be not necessarily to do with death, but it might be when you're in a placement and someone... But could you imagine you go into hospital, you've got to wear a gown, you, your bum's hanging out, you've got all these people poking you and putting needles in you, like all those things, you, you've lost your, your dignity to some point, you've lost your self-esteem. So that kind of loss would be considered a perceived loss, that you perceive, you feel that something now about you has been lost. And it's normally because, for us as nurses, because we put a patient in that, that situation. Maturational loss. So that's obviously to do with um, us growing and, and things maturing. So from, from my experience, 
you could say, if I was that bothered about it, that losing my hair would have been a maturational loss. I got old and I got fat uh, and I lost my hair. And if I was bothered by that, I would have been going through that loss. An example that maybe, you know, that probably doesn't apply to lots of you who are going to go this bald and, and get this fat, but you could say that that would be um, maybe when our kids leave the house. And I don't mean, you know, go, go to school, but when they leave and they grow up and they leave the house and, or it could be that now we've got kids who go to university and they never call again and they don't come around for Sunday dinner. Call your parents. Um, that could be your parents are going through a, a maturational loss because now you've left the nest, you're leaving them alone. A situational loss would be something like something unexpected in life that has the potential to kind of change what you're going through at the time. So an obvious example of that one would be a sudden breakup or a divorce. So something unexpected that now has changed my usual world would be that situational loss. So grief. So we can see there that it's the emotional suffering or distress experience as a result of a loss. And this, I suppose, is quite difficult to deal with because everyone, a bit like pain, everyone responds to grief, everyone has a different behaviour or output to grief. And it's really difficult to know as us as nurses how we can deal with that. Grief is a normal response to loss, but how, how do you respond to grief is going to be different to how I respond to grief. I've looked after families and there's been um, families that have lost a baby and they were very, very outwardly emotive. And it was really difficult to, to deal with. And it was really difficult because I found I was trying to, uh, this was when I was a student, I was trying to kind of, you know, console them. And I ended up getting consoled by the mother. Like, I was obviously so distressed that the mum came and gave me a hug because I was upset. I thought, how, how weird is that? I would say, while we're on this one, it's fine if you're in a situation in work that is upsetting, it's fine to be upset by that. And to be honest, if, if anything happened to my children and I was in ED and God forbid anything really bad happened and I looked around at the nursing staff and the doctors and everyone was like, okay, well, let's go back to the patient, I'd be even more distraught. It's okay to outwardly, if you feel like crying, that's fine. It's okay to have a tear. If you're doing something with a patient, you might be in recess and it's not going very well. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to grieve. If you've gone to my extent where people, the family are consoling you, maybe you've grieved a bit too much. Maybe, maybe that's time for you to go home and have a cry. Um, but it's okay to grieve in the facility as long as you kind of keep yourself in check a little bit. So the stages of grief. Now, I'm putting this up here, but I am going to put the caveat on here that these stages of grief have been kind of condemned for being way too simplistic. And, and I'm not saying that this is the thing that everybody goes through. This is the stages that everybody goes through and they go through in that order. The only reason I'm putting this up is because I think it's important to know that when you go through loss, when you go through grief, there are going to be lots of different stages that people go through. Now, I am going to premise this with you're not the person there to be a punching bag. You're not, it doesn't matter if people are going through an issue, they're going through loss, they're going through grief. You're not there to take their abuse, but it is important for you to understand what kind of things people are going through. Now, people aren't going to go through in a nice systematic way all these different things until they get to acceptance. It might be they go for, straight from denial to acceptance. It might be that they go from denial to anger to denial back to anger again. And it's not important to know kind of exactly where they are, but just knowing that people go through different stages and even people in the same family might be at a different stage is important so you can kind of care for the family as a whole and not just assume that everybody is at this same place because different people in the family might need you to be different with them and interact with them quite differently. So I was having a look at this before and, and I realised that, you know, being my size, I'm kind of up for a lot of these causes of death. Probably heart disease is going to be somewhere in my future that will probably result into something to do with my brain, probably diabetes somewhere along the line when I put on a few more kilos. But you can see from all of these, the medium age, I mean, apart from melanoma, we're almost 80, is well over 80, which is, which is quite kind of, you know, comforting. Apart from intentional self-harm, a medium age of, of not even 45. 
The other problem with these kind of stats is that with self-harm and suicide and things, a lot of them actually get categorised as other stuff. So things might get categorised as a motor vehicle accident. So not all of them have the distinct kind of this was a suicide, this was self-harm. So I would say that that's uh, number 13, that would probably in reality be a lot higher whilst assisted suicide is still illegal in most of Australia, in Victoria in 2017 they legalised a physician assisted suicide. This was the first lady to go through that. The doctor was well informed, um, was very supportive. Um, you know, mum was able to have the option in that written request to explain why she chose to have a voluntary assisted death. And what did she say? <sighs> that um, she no longer had any joy in her life. I'm she... sorry, Nicole. I'm sorry, Jackie. It's okay. There's a great deal of public interest in this issue, though, and so I'm not... It's by no yeah. means my intention no, to trigger you no. into tears, and I, 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 I apologise, and I regret that that's where it's gone. I'm sorry, but at the same time, the public do want to know because no yep. one's ever done this before in no. Australia. Exactly. Look, she was a very independent person throughout her life, um, and she was no longer able to be independent in any area of her life. Um, she couldn't even feed herself anymore. Did she have any second thoughts? Did any of you have any doubts? No, no, not at all. And we would say to her, even, you know, between appointments with the doctors, you know, are you sure this is what you want to do? And every time she was, yes, this this is for me. This is what I want to do. I want to continue and push forward. Mm. Um, there was absolutely point. no doubt in her mind that this is what she wanted. So notice there that they were speaking and she said that the reason that she went through was because she wasn't independent in anything in her life anymore. Which if you think back to when we did our ADLs and we, we looked at that, um, that independent, dependent continuum, like this lady obviously got to the point where there was nothing that she was dependent in and her quality of life was just, um, you know, was not worth having. After a doctor has got a permit for the patient, uh, the doctor will then send us a prescription. The patient will then contact the statewide pharmacy service requesting the medications. At that point, we'll go and visit the patient wherever they are and sit down with them and whoever, they, whoever else they want to be there and we will go through the medications with them. We'll provide the medications in this in a locked box, in a, in a kit. The kit contains patient information. It contains a locked box with the medication in it, as well as some other pre-medications they take um, earlier. The box has three parts. Um, in, in the locked box is the actual medication. The patient uh, pours um, a small amount of bottle A and into a glass. They then empty the total contents of the uh, medication and mix that and then add a small amount of bottle C. They mix that up and then they take that. What we do is we explain the process to the patient. We leave the medications with the patient. We answer any questions they may have. Um, the medications are left with the patient and it's up to the patient to decide if and when they choose to take that medication. They prepare um, and mix the medications immediately before they take it. The role of the statewide pharmacy service is to educate them, do that in a compassionate manner, um, and make sure the medications are provided in a safe manner for them. We provide the medications, the education, and that's our role. It is the patient's choice when and where they take the medications. So palliative care, the person who wrote your chapter in Crispin Taylor, John Rosenberg, I had the, I had, uh, the fortune of working with when I was at UQ, and he, um, I never really thought about palliative care, um, and that was his thing. And, well, obviously he wrote the chapter in your book. Um, but he was very passionate about palliative care, and he spoke very much about kind of palliative care wasn't about finding a cure or finding a fix, but it was about enhancing the days that people had not extending the days people had, but enhancing the days that they've got left. 
So it wasn't about trying to fix something or trying to keep them here for longer, but the days they had left, the couple of months or the couple of weeks they had, to try and fill that up as much as possible with something that made that patient feel like their quality of life wasn't completely um, impinged on by the fact that they had a terminal illness. Unfortunately, a majority of people are um, over 60 because, as I said before, getting old is unfortunately a terminal condition. There's no way that we can reverse that one. So a lot of your patients in palliative care are going to be over 60. And we've already mentioned some of the conditions that might unfortunately give us um, the illness that is going to maybe uh, eventuate into palliative care. So what kind of things are palliative care? Now, you can see that, that there's quite a few things that are involved in there. But you can see not one of them talks about a cure. Not one of them talks about trying to, um, to overly invest in medical procedures. We do have up here um, relief of pain, other symptoms. However, it should be known that just because someone's palliative doesn't mean that there is always going to be associated pain. Just because someone is in the end of life and is dying doesn't mean that there's going to be a pain there. But there is going to be lots of symptom can symptom control, symptom management, but there isn't going to be a cure. There's no fix, but you're trying to make people, and I don't like this phrase, but I'm going to use it, as comfortable as possible. So it's about trying to look at what they need and tailor everything you do to make them feel as comfortable and appropriate in the last couple of days. And I say last couple of days, but palliative care, you can be in it for you know a year or two. Um, so the terminal part of your palliative care is obviously right at the end, but as soon as you're diagnosed with a terminal illness, it might be two years. It might be the doctor says, look, you've got a year left. I'm going to provide palliative care services. And it might be that I'm starting to get financial assistance because I can't work anymore. Um, I can't do much around the house because of whatever my illness is precluding me from doing. Um, I might get a nurse to come and see me. But it still might be a year or two that I'm under that palliative care service. Palliative care is really kind of an umbrella term that includes all of these different things. Hospice care is basically, because a lot of this we try and provide at home, and you know, you'll have the nurse come in and you'll have support services go to, go to someone's house. If, however, they need to go into a facility, that would be hospice, which provides palliative care. So it's really just the place that palliative care is provided, if not at home. So palliative care, as I've already mentioned, again on there you're not going to find anything about treatment or cure, but the first one is going to be symptom management end-of-life care. Now, this could be things down to um, finding out what they want to do with uh, you know, their will, um, who they're going to leave in charge of making decisions. So end-of-life care can include lots of things like that. It might even include um, things such as their funeral, what they would like, what they want from their funeral, and planning all those things before they're unable to make those decisions for themselves. Education for them, but more importantly for the family as well. It's always normally the family who kind of are left behind are the ones that are probably going to need a lot more education and understanding and also knowing what services are available afterwards. For anyone that's gone through having um, a family member pass away and you'll find that, you know, people rally around and they organise a funeral and they all come together, but then as soon as the funeral's done, the poor family's just left and that's when the grief kind of kicks in. So during the time of being palliative, it might be that the family are really kind of rock solid because they've got a focus, they've got something to do, but it's not until that person passes away that everything kind of falls apart. So make sure that when you're educating patients, you're educating them on what kind of services are available after the patient passes, um, which includes emotional support and the grief and bereavement, um, which a lot of hospitals will, will put in place um, in palliative care services. So anyone in here, and not that I'm expecting anyone to have planned their funeral or anything, but has anyone, has anyone spoken to uh, their, their family about wanting to be an organ donor or anything like that? Now, organ donation is obviously only one, one of those things, and not that, you know, you're all very young and, and fit, and I'm not expecting anyone to be planning their funeral or, or thinking of their end-of-life cares, but whilst most of us think that, you know, we should definitely talk about what we want in the end of life, only a quarter of us have actually spoken to our family and only 6% have actually talked to the doctor. 
Now, that seems like a massive jump from 79 to 6%, because whilst our family is important for organizing those things, this is what I want in my funeral, um, the doctor might be the one that when you don't have capacity, the doctor might be the one who knows you and says, this is what the patient wanted beforehand. I'm going to... Um, uh, I'm going to request this is what the treatment needs to be because that's what they wanted from me before they, you know, went into this decline and were unable to provide their own um, answers. Um, so what I would encourage is when people are in that palliative phase that you do encourage them, like I said before, that you encourage them to speak to their family, get their family involved, but also make sure they've got a plan with the doctors as well. I'm not expecting you to, to remember all of this, but what I did want to put on there, because sometimes we think of palliative care that it's basically from go to woe, it's going to happen really quickly. But you can see here that it starts off with, um, I'm not really sure if I like the question in. The question is, would you be surprised? Um, would you be surprised if your patient were to die in the next six or 12 months? So we can be talking 12 months out that we're starting palliative care, but sometimes we often think of, as soon as we're in palliative care, that's it, 12 months, bang, I'm dead. But you can see here that we can, we can go to the next one and then we can have some clinical improvement so I can go back here. So whilst I'm given 12 months, that might extend out for a period of time. So whilst I might have been given a prognosis of 12 months, I might still be kicking around for two or three years. So it's important that you don't just kind of plan for that period of time, but you think about, okay, well, in the best case scenario, if those things actually extend for this period of time, um, how are we going to cope with those things? Because it might be the patient wants you to treat them as much as possible in the house, but realistically, is the government going to pay for that for three years? It's probably unlikely that's going to happen. So if you are kicking around for three years, what kind of services can we put in in? In provision? Is it going to be that you're going to go to hospice care? Is it that you're going to move in with family and friends? Is it that we're going to have to get your equipment to stay in your home for longer? So it's important not just to think about the prognosis, but the best case scenario. If that extends, what other things can we put in place? When we're talking about end of life, we're talking here mainly about nursing care. So obviously end of life, and we can put that down to death and we know what happens there. But end of life, we're talking about what happens during end of life and the kind of things that we do as nurses during that stage. So end of life changes. Now this is, this is obviously before someone has passed away. And the changes are very similar to when someone has died. And I'm going to talk about them in a little while. Um, but we can see here that calling, uh, confusion, which kind of comes down to the emotional changes. So we might um, talk in confusing statements. Um, we probably don't want to eat or drink anymore. We're probably not going to be able to swallow very well. Uh, bowel and bladder control. Um, changes in breathing. So you'll notice there's certain patterns that normally will uh, indicate that someone is quite imminently going to pass away. And it's actually really good that it's normally the ENs who can really pick up on these things before the RN, especially in aged care placement, because the EN normally has a lot more contact directly day to day with the patient, because the RN might be kind of in charge of like a whole floor or maybe the whole facility, but the ENs are working in, you know, day in, day out with these patients that they can pick up on these subtle cues and change in breathing patterns is normally one that signifies kind of, you know, the end of life or that, that terminal phase. This also is something that I find really difficult um, to deal with. And I suppose that sometimes if we're feeling uncomfortable with this, it's not a topic that we want to talk to people about. I think, however, it's really important because once that person has passed away and you're left with a family that you've made no attempt to build a rapport with or understand or able to speak, it's really difficult to know how you can deliver care because it's not just about your patient, it's about their whole family as well you should be responsible for the family and providing them support and the care that they need post that incident, post that person um, dying. And if you haven't spent time building that rapport, this is going to become really difficult. It is, however, really important because it's often the family that are the ones that know their patient in, in, or their family member um, inside and out. They're going to be able to tell you exactly what they want or exactly what they liked, um, down to things like when someone is, um, is the end of life. Were they a kind of person that wanted to be touched? Were they the kind of person that wanted their hand to be held? Or were they someone who was just like, no, I, I'm not a hugger, I'm not one of those? Because 
whilst we might think, well, you know, when, when people are dying and we see in the movies that there's lots of hand-holding by the nurse and, and stroking and art, oh, I don't want that. I'm not that in real life. I don't want you to be holding my hand and stroking my hand when I'm about to die because I don't want that now. But the only way you're going to know that is because you've talked to the family members and the people that were closest to them. So please, even though it's uncomfortable, try and talk to the family and encourage them as much as possible to be involved in the cares as well. So even down to if a patient is unable to get out of bed and they need bed baths, well, maybe their wife, maybe their husband is quite happy to take on that role because they feel that they can actually do something and they can impact their, their wife or their husband in those last moments. So please don't be afraid to talk to the family and try and encourage them to get involved. Don't force them, obviously, but do try and encourage them to be there. I'm not going to go through these because you can all read. What I am going to say, however, while slightly morbid, I would really like you to take on board these and learn. I don't think these things are going to be on Wikipedia, but I want you to get a Wikipedia definition of why these things happen. The reason being, my firstborn, he was about three months, and when I went back to work, um, this was at the Marta Children's Hospital when it was still open, we had a recess, and the baby was already dead when they came in. And we had to keep going, because um, normally when they come in, they're asystolic, you try for a little bit just to see if anything happens. And it was a coronial case, because it was unexpected, which I'll mention in a minute. And for a coronial case, basically, the parents can um, sit with the, the baby. There's normally a quiet room in EDs and ICUs. But it means that a nurse has to sit with them to make sure they don't remove any tubes. And I sat with them. The parents were really young. I think they were like about 17. And obviously, they've gone through something really traumatic. And they were asking me some of these questions. The one that they kept saying, and it was almost like that she was just kind of like in this kind of broken record. She kept saying, why is he cold? Uh, I froze. I was like, I, 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 I don't know how to provide a really simplified, because the parents don't want you to kind of crack out, oh, well, actually, uh, this is what happens, and let me pull out my Crisp and Taylor. And I froze because I didn't know what to say. And she was quite young. She had a low education. So I was trying to simplify it as much as possible. But every time I did, why is, why is the baby cold? And it was almost like every five minutes she was asking me the same thing. And I really, really struggled. I had to sit there with the parents trying to desperately get through these questions. And I was having this massive freak out. And for any of you that have kids or when you have kids, that's all you can do. It was my first recess since the, the birth of my son. And it was a little boy, and that's all I could think of. And I was having this massive freak out. So whilst this is a little bit morbid for you to go home and have a look, have a look at those and just have a real basic understanding. Because unfortunately, you may be asked those. Family might be going, oh, well, why is she just wet herself? I thought, I thought she just died. Find these out, because this isn't the time, unfortunately. This is probably one of those times you can't just go, I don't know, great question, but I go and find out for you. No, they want you to tell them now. They don't need anything in-depth or complicated, but a really basic understanding of these. So if you don't know, or if you're like, oh, I probably need to check, go and look at these. Why do these things happen? The main thing on this screen is the bottom one here. Now. How I've been banging on to all of you in Simlabs about talking to the mannequin, I'm going to also do that when you have a patient that has passed away. They are still your patient until the very, very end. Whether they're picked up by the coroner or they're picked up by um, the funeral home, they're your patient until you do absolutely everything for them. I feel that it's very important to talk to them just like they're your patient. I want you to think, if that was someone that you loved, and a nurse was looking after them, how would you want them to be looked after? Yes, they might have died, but their body's still there. And while they're in hospital, they're your patient. The story I have for this one, it was actually the same, the same boy who had passed away, and it was the, the, the coronial case. So we had to wait for the coroner. And I remember the coroner turning up, and he was obviously not used to coming to peds. He was obviously used to picking up adults. And I remember walking from the room, and the problem was that the quiet room, I had to walk through the whole department to get to emergency, because that's where the coroner could pull up to, where the ambulance would go. And I had to walk through the whole department, get them into, 
into the, to the recess room so I could wrap them and put them in the bag. And, and I thought, how am I going to do that? That's really weird because you'll find in hospitals for adults, they have these big trolleys and they have a sheet over. And if you hear one rattling down the corridor, it's empty. If you hear one and it kind of glides quietly, there's a body underneath. Because obviously they're not going to have a body there for everyone to see. Oh, there's a dead person, let me walk through. So they put them under this, this uh, metal trolley. We don't do that with kids. So I wrap them up, I, sh I, I wrap them up, you know like when you kind of, you know, wrap your kids up like a burrito when they're kind of going off to bed. So I wrapped the child up and I carried it and I faced him towards me so no one could see that he was blue. And I walked through the department and I walked to the room and it was really awkward because obviously I was carrying him in a way that everyone kind of kept coming up to me and going, oh, look, a cute baby. And I was like, I'm sorry, I've got to rush. And I got to the recess room and the coroner was there and I laid the baby down and I was talking to him and I was using his name and I was wrapping him up and I was telling him, right, I'm going to wrap you up. So I'm just going to make you nice and warm. I'm just going to put you in this bag so the man can take you to the... And this coroner was looking at me like, are you a bloody idiot, mate? Clearly not used to dealing with, with, with kids. But for me, that would just be, I would feel really heartless to, to take someone's baby, go through that, wrap them up and send them to a coroner to do all that without feeling that they were still my patient. And for anyone who has, I banged on enough about your, your sim labs and talking to your mannequin, talking to your patient, for me, is your foundation nursing. If you can't talk to a patient, you need to stop worrying about all these fancy skills that you need to do and you need to focus on that. And that includes you talking to someone after they've died. So one day when you see me and I've had a massive MI and because I'm, you know, I'm now that obese, please can you talk me through it? Because I'm going to be quite embarrassed because you're going to have to wash me. So can you talk me through it? Even though I'm dead, I'm still going to be quite embarrassed. So talk me through that process as you, you toddle me off to the coroner. I'm going to say this, and I know that it's not going to be one of you that when I die, that's, that's, that makes me upset. I want someone that I've taught to be the one that sees me out of this world. So if someone can hang around long enough as a nurse, I would be really, really happy. No selfies, please. Now, care of the deceased, we will be discussing this um, within your, within your uh, lab. Different hospitals are going to have very, very different policies um, about how you... Um, do last rites or how you lay out a patient. So you can see there, this is your kind of basics of how you do it. Some of the things you would do, um, so if you can, you would straighten the limbs. Hopefully you found that patient before rigor mortis sets in. Put their dentures in, um, close the eyelids. Now this is for a non-coronial uh, uh, person. You can remove all tubes and everything. Now. We're going to be discussing that, but if you have to double, double check that it's not a coronial investigation before you do all those things. So jewelry, you make sure that you and another person is taking them off, you're documenting them, and you're giving them immediately to someone in the family who can also sign for them as well. You wash the body, depending on where you are, you might do, um, so it says here, wash the body, and you do all those things. Please, if you're with me, don't shave me, that's rude. <laughs> I would like to leave this world with a magnificent beard. Wounds are covered. Now, it's important that the wounds are covered because, as you can see later on, that um, things will start leaking, and that will include open wounds. So you want to make sure that they're dressed, so when things do start to leak, um, we're covering up those open wounds that, you know, like pressure areas or anything like that. And, and also, we're taking cannulas out that we dress them appropriately so things don't start leaking as well. Now, what no one told me, and this isn't, this isn't a word of a lie, I did a night shift, my first adult death, it was in a private hospital. It was actually like a horror movie outside. It was like, rain. it was in England, it's always raining. It was raining, there was thunder outside. It was a night shift, and we went in, and the patient had passed away, and I'd never done this before, and my nurse was really, really great. She said, look, come with me, let's go through it. But what no one told me is while things start leaking, when you die, there is still air in your lungs. So naturally, that air is going to come out because things start to relax, including your lungs. And when we rolled the patient to clean her, she went, <laughs> And I was holding her thinking, oh my God, have we just made the worst decision possible by, you know, and I've looked and my, my nurse, you know, God bless her, thought that was the funniest thing in the world. <laughs> is wetting herself on the other side. Thankfully, no family come in as she's laughing and I'm, you know, white as a ghost. 
But just in case you do this, there is air in the lungs, just like there is other fluids. So there might be feces, there might be urine, they might groan at you because there's air. They might fart at you as well. These are all normal things. Do not freak out. Please do not, like you guys are doing, please don't hit the giggles when you're doing that one because you can be guaranteed that's when your CF will come in the room and go, what are you doing? Place body in a shroud bag. Sometimes some hospitals have a double shroud. Now, a coronial investigation, very, very different. Now, like I said before, the biggest difference is that we don't remove any of the things that we've done to the patient. Now, the reason something is a coronial investigation, as you can see there, so it could be unexpected. So from my experience, the baby, um, you don't expect a six-month-old to, to die, so that was obviously an unexpected death. It was violent or unnatural, so anyone who's committed suicide, um, anyone who's been murdered, it could even be that the doctor hasn't seen them for a while, so refuses to sign their, their certificate because they can't definitely guarantee this is the, why the patient passed. If it was in a health-related facility and it was likely due to a health-related incident, such as post-surgery, then that would be a coronial. Now, the reason that we don't remove anything is because, so for my example, in emergency, in the resus, we've done all these things, so we've intubated, we've put cannulas in, we've done all those lovely things. We need to leave them in place because when they go to the coroner, the coroner needs to know, was that the reason they passed? So they need to have a look and make sure that everything's in place so they can definitely say the intubation was fine, that's not a reason for their death, let's move on. If you remove all these things and the coroner sees that there was some trauma to the airway, that might be kind of a, a train of thought that they go down unnecessarily. So your, in, your involvement in a coronial, like I said, so you will be there, you might have to be there to make sure that nothing is removed. You might be the one having to document everything down. Because of that, because of your involvement, you might be asked to be a witness. Now that doesn't have any professional consequence, that's purely that you're going there to say, this is what happened and this is my documentation. If something was done, and maybe you fudged your documentation, or maybe on a night shift you fell asleep for four hours and you didn't check the patient. Those kind of things are going to uh, be a reason that you get uh, struck off.